What's going on analysts? Welcome to another episode of our All About Analysis YouTube channel, where we interview guests involved in policing and public safety and their insights into all things crime analysis. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's guest is Tony Ventura, he recently appointed Director of Information Technology Services at the Peel Regional Police Service in Ontario, Canada. During the past year and a half, Tony has been in charge of the Analytics Bureau at Peel Police, where he managed a team of crime intelligence analysts, researchers, and data scientists. He has a bachelor's degree in justice studies and a master's in leadership. Tony, glad you could join us today. Thanks for some of your time and welcome to the channel, man. Thank you. It's great to be here and talk to our uh, friends in policing. Tell me what you've learned about crime analysis during your transition from the IT side into the analytics world. And how much of an asset do you think your IT background plays? So my journey to crime analysis and analytics was an unconventional one. Uh, in 1993, I joined the Toronto Police Service as a uh, entry level um, IT person and I was doing desk site support. And I worked my way uh, through the ranks there. And then after 12 years at Toronto, I, uh, my family situation had changed. I moved to the suburbs and I found a job at Peer Regional Police where I've been ever since. Uh, I joined as an entry level IT person, promoting, uh, getting promoted through the ranks to manager. Uh, and then after uh, about seven years as manager, I was asked to start the analytics bureau for Peer Regional Police. It is something that had been um, approved through our chain of command and funded, but uh, they had some difficulty filling the spot and thought that I was the person to get the role started. So when I left IT, I very much said to all of my colleagues, now that I'm leaving IT, I want to be treated like a customer. I want to understand the, the days, uh, the ups and downs of the day in the life of our customers. So I didn't want any special favors. I didn't want to get any uh, preferential treatment when it came to getting IT support. Um, so then when I transitioned into the analytics bureau, I, uh, I really had to sink or swim. I didn't really have an analytics background and uh, I had to, to learn everything as I went. So the very first thing that I did, and it's fundamentally what I believe in general, is get to learn the people. And uh, the people are the key to any service-oriented business. So I spent a lot of time uh, listening and learning and uh, taking it all in. Um, once I uh, had been there for about 90 days, I put together a five-year plan of what I thought the staffing should look like and what lines of business uh, should be created. So in that, I proposed that there would be two separate and distinct lines of business under analytics. One of them is the traditional crime analysis role where we help catch uh, bad guys is the way I phrase it. And then the second part of that would be the police analytics side where we look at things like uh, response time, time on call, how are we spending our resources, where are we spending our time. Uh, in support of that, our executive team was extremely supportive and provided us the sufficient funding that we were able to go out and hire five uh, additional staff and, uh, and to acquire some software to do that as well. So the last 18 months were around me building the team and uh, acquiring the software solution, which actually the software solution just launched last week uh, with our first dashboard for our real-time operation center. And in that time, I was able to hire a data scientist, two business intelligence specialists, and a uh, project manager, and a, um, a data engineer. So the data engineer was responsible for uh, helping us find all the data and build out the ETL leaders. The BI specialist did some analysis around the data and uh, build the visualizations. And our data scientist worked with our frontline customers to determine statistical models and try to figure out the problems that we needed to solve through analysis. That's outstanding. And those are some very realistic requirements. How many analysts do you currently manage? And what challenges have you encountered? So there were 17 of, I would call, the traditional crime analysts that everyone knows an intelligence analyst. And in addition to that, I, I did grow up the team, as I talked about, from the analytics bureau. One of the big challenges that I found is geography. So because our analysts are appropriately working with their customers, the police officers, it makes it difficult because we don't have line, I as a manager don't have line of sight to them all the time. So it was really important for me to, to keep the lines of communication open, do lots of emailing, communicating, phone conferences, et cetera. And I really tried to get out to see everybody. Of course, COVID hit in March, which was sort of six years into my, uh, sorry, six months into uh, my assignment there. So visiting became a real problem and we all ended up working from home for a period of time. Um, but again, I was very responsive on my email. And again, it, it helps build a connection, rapid uh, back and forth emails even can be like a conversation. So very much we did a lot of communicating that way and supported them in that way. So that was one of the big challenges. The other challenge I would say uh, with crime analysis in general, and it's not mine, but it's uh, in general in crime analysis is that 
Analysts really are part of the investigative team, but because analysts are civilian members, they're not necessarily always embraced. They, from a lot of the feedback I got from my analysts, they're sometimes an afterthought when there's a big event uh, that's happened and the analyst isn't notified until two or three days later and a lot of activity has already been done. Also, officers tend to be very type A personality and will solve all the problems by themselves if you let them, uh, the easy way or the hard way. Where an analyst is really good at doing the stuff in the easy way to free people up from drudgery, the officers will get through it, but maybe not in the most expeditious way. So I think that hurts the value proposition of what an analyst can really do in the grand scheme of things. That civilian sworn divide seems to be a common challenge. What changes, if any, have you implemented in the analytics bureau since being appointed? And any visions for the future of crime and intelligence analysis at Peel Police? So again, the biggest single change that I had made in, in my tenure in the analytics bureau was creating that analytics side of the house with the data scientists and whatnot. And that's going to help us in the longer term in terms of statistical reporting, but also trying to build out predictive models. So some of the models that we're working on currently are victimization models. So rather than look looking at where crimes are actually taking place, let's look at an offender um, specific view on that and say, all of the offenders, all the people that we come into contact live in this poor part of town. Perhaps they have food insecurity, perhaps they have uh, job insecurity, perhaps they have housing insecurity. And if we can get them out of those risk factors, potentially we can solve crime by avoiding it altogether. So rather than taking a victim or occurrence based, well, here's where the occurrence happened, let's try to get deep down to the root cause of some of these things and actually try to, to prevent things rather than just uh, us always uh, arresting the offenders. Um, again, from a, a police analytics perspective, I think that um, in, in certain lines of business, and I'm gonna use the example of call centers. So you call Rogers Cable, you call the Bell phone company. They're very good at measuring their lines of business. And uh, when I say this, people often cringe, but 911 is a big call center and we should be able to manage the metrics. Granted, there will always be outliers. There's always going to be a call that might take an hour or two hours or a hostage taking or something like that. But for the most part, we should have a pretty good handle on what performance can look like. Same thing when uh, attending a call, a break and enter. Yes, it might be an outlier, might be a really easy one or it might be a really complicated one. But we should be able to get to you know, 80, 20, 80% 80 of the time, uh, a, um, a break and enter call should take you this many hours. And then let's start looking at the outliers and see if there's explanations for that. So I think there's a lot of efficiency to be gained by looking at the numbers and looking at the metrics, which uh, traditionally is something that we've not done as police agencies. That's a huge undertaking. Tell me, what's analysis going to look like in the next three years? So I, I think in three years' time, um, it, it's the, the will of the chief, and I support it wholeheartedly, is we have to get to uh, evidence-based decision-making. Let's deploy maybe not based on where crime is happening, but where our communities are at risk, where there are poor people. And let's bring our community partners into play and say, this is an area where it's typically a lot of food insecurity. So let's see if we can connect them with social services and food banks and prevent that. So I think really we have to evolve from a responsive, uh, responding to all the calls to really a proactive way and taking a long view. Now, that's not to say that all crime can be prevented. There are lots of crimes of opportunity. There's lots of crimes of passion. Those are next to impossible to predict. But if we can, again, 80-20, get you know, the uh, repeat offenders in our system, get them the help they need. Maybe they need psychological help. Maybe they have mental health challenges. Maybe it's food insecurity. If we can help them with those issues, then we can really make a change in, in public safety for the good. I'm certainly looking forward to those changes at Peel Police. Now let's talk about technology. There's a ton of advanced software currently in the market today. What's your take on all these tools for law enforcement? That's a really great question. And, and kind of being an, an IT guy at heart, that, that's one that, you know, my tendency would be, well, let's find a new fancy tool that's going to do this for us. I think the challenge is, and, and I really saw this when I joined the analytics bureau, is because there are so many tools, the toolbox tends to get too big. So you buy a tool that does this, that does X and, and Y, and then there's overlap with other tools. And then you find yourself at a, a, a crossroads where you have a number of different tools that all do the same thing, and you don't know which one to use or uh, your software maintenance bill start, starts to go up as well. So I think we have to, uh, I think there's a bit of an evolution in place where we always have to look at the new and uh, shiny tools, but for perhaps for every new tool you bring in, you should retire one so that you always have a manageable tool set so that it's not just about connect, collecting the new and shiny. And certainly in IT where we're really good at new and shiny. So that was a struggle that I had to, to take on and say, you know, we have a lot of tools that have a significant amount of overlap. Do we need to uh, overlap them? Do we need to acquire more? Do we just need to uh, enhance the, uh, the, the skill set in one specific tool 
and make sure that we're getting common output from all of our analysts. They're making sure they all work into the appropriate level. Because sometimes it's not a, we might blame a deficiency on the tool that maybe is because of lack of training or um, lack of application of knowledge or just looking at things differently. So uh, it should never be technology for technology's sake. And, that, and that's always kind of a bit of a struggle because the vendors are really good at selling and there are some really fancy tools out there, but you know, do you need them all or do you just need to have three or four and be really, really good at them? A bit of a philosophical question. These are fascinating insights. Certainly an example of the value you bring with your IT background. Now you have a large team of analysts at Peel Police. What are the challenges of managing such a large team and how do you ensure their skill sets are keeping up with trends both in technology and crime? That's a really great question. And notwithstanding the fact that we have a large team, uh, I mean, it's 17, which is a fair number, but I would actually say that we're understaffed. And uh, in the 2021 budget, we were approved for two additional analysts for new lines of business. So uh, the two analyst positions that we've created, one is going to focus on gun gangs, uh, drugs, and human trafficking type issues, really, uh, you know, crimes that really affect people. And the other one is to look after priority populations. So as we've identified in our community safety and well-being plan, we really want to get to root cause of uh, uh, causality on crime. So let's focus on certain groups that are experiencing more crime. So let's focus on the youth. Let's focus on elderly. Let's focus on people with mental health challenges or food insecurity or or uh, job insecurity. Um, so uh, again, even though 17 sounds like a big number, it's still, uh, I think, small for our agency. And, and uh, again, in getting two more, that'll help. Um, it is very problematic uh, in managing a big team because there's also um, some natural progression that needs to happen. What I found is analysts tend to uh, pick a portfolio and then tend to stay in that portfolio for a long period of time. Um, so we need people to be able to rotate between portfolios to cover illnesses and parental leaves and things like that, but also for building staff uh, development. For example, the role of a divisional crime analyst is sort of a jack of all trades where they're digging into all kinds of different crime types and all kinds of different crime patterns. And then we have our uh, bureau analysts who focus on robbery or traffic safety or special victims and sexual assault type things. And those are very, very specialized. So where at a division you go a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, at a bureau, you'll go a mile deep and an inch wide on a specific matter. So the skill sets obviously are the same, but they're applied in different ways. So I think there should be some healthy rotation. We have been fortunate in that we've had a little bit of, uh, I mean, traditional crime analysis has been very static and, and people don't move a lot. But in the last 18 months, we've had a few parental leaves that gave us some opportunities to bring in some new blood into the unit. It gave some people the opportunity to switch up portfolios and to, to exercise their different skills. I've always said a change is as good as a rest. And sometimes it's not even just about the work, but it's the change of scenery, working for a different inspector, working with different officers on different subject matter. It can really refresh and bring new life back to people and, and really recharge them. Uh, and I would say the same for me, like putting myself in analytics was really kind of a big change from a 25 year IT guy, but I really learned a lot. And I really am appreciative for that experience. And coming back, I find that I'm better for it. That experience has helped change my perspective and how I will be now as an IT director. These are great career development opportunities for analysts, and I certainly applaud you for your efforts. Police services are extremely sensitive when it comes to the security of their data, and rightly so. I understand your agency is considering a managed cloud solution. In your view, what do you see as the pros and cons, and where do you stand on this issue? That's, that's a great question. And it's funny because uh, being in IT for as long as I have, for the last 10 years or so, it's been a big discussion about what do we do with cloud? What do we do with cloud? We always knew even 10 years ago, cloud is coming and we're going to have to figure out what our approach is going to be. Um, so what we had done in the analytics bureau, and really it was a very practical um, answer or a practical approach that we took. Uh, our IT department has a project queue uh, in almost, uh, almost 200 projects in the queue. The police chief started and said, hey, I want to start an analytics bureau. We need to get it going. Well, I can't be 190, number 198 in the, in the queue. I need to get my business objectives done. In order to transform the business, we need to do this. So how do I do that? Well, outsource the activity. So in uh, getting uh, a managed service and hosting it in the cloud, that allowed me to jump to the front of the line, uh, help me uh, retain the contractors that I need to help us get the solution set up. And it takes away of a lot of the maintenance that IT has to do after the fact. So notwithstanding the fact when we do an IT project, we implement a solution and there's a lot of upfront work. And then there's incremental work that comes every month, patching, upgrades, reboots, data uh, recovery and backup. 
All of those things now I've been able to outsource to somebody else. So they're doing that work. So not only did I free IT from having to do that work up front, I also freed them from having to do any of that long-term maintenance, which means I'm not guaranteeing them a pipeline. Uh, in our specific case, um, to satisfy the uh, the data requirements, we knew going in that our data was protected B, and that's what we'd be putting in the cloud, which is permissible according to the federal government guidelines. In addition to that, our cloud solution, uh, notwithstanding that it is in an Amazon cloud, it's in an infrastructure as a service. So it's as close to private cloud as you can get. So there's no multi-tenancies, there's nobody else on our servers, they're all for us, but they're being managed by our uh, our provider in the middle, uh, so we don't actually have a relationship directly with Amazon. We have an, uh, a relationship with our managed service provider and they manage all the stuff on the back end in Amazon's cloud. We built a VPN tunnel to secure the transactions uh, here and uh, back and forth. We've locked the IP to our environment so that no one else can get access to it. So notwithstanding, there are some additional risks in doing cloud. Uh, by doing them appropriately, um, they can be managed. So in addition to this platform as a service approach that we've taken, we also did a privacy impact assessment and a threat risk assessment to, to lay out the fra uh, framework of what we needed to do to make sure that this solution was secure uh, for PO police. And then now that we have gone live, we are planning a penetration test to go and validate all the things that we should have done from the threat risk assessment. So it's really the checks and balances to make sure that we've achieved the, uh, uh, the business outcomes and that the data is safe. Yep, PO once again is taking the lead with your technological advancements. What's your view on predictive policing? As you know, it's been a bit of a controversy these days. I think predictive policing is, is a very interesting topic. And to be honest, I'm not sure that I have a super strong opinion one way or another. I think there is value in predictive policing because it can help us uh, identify people or crime types that are regular and repeatable. Um, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, some, some are crimes of passion, some are crimes of opportunity. You're not gonna be able to predict those because you don't know when the 17 year old will be walking down the street, find an expensive bike and decide to grab it. That's, you can't predict those, those are very much crimes of opportunity. Um, and again, crimes of passion sometimes, uh, usually I would say a domestic or something like that, those may or may not be preventable because sometimes we do have domestic homicides with no history of violence. So not everything is predictable. I think the other thing that we have to consider is that, and I think some of the critics might be right in terms of um, does predictiveness tend to lead us to over police certain communities? And I certainly think that it, there is a value, uh, not value, there's merit to that argument. Um, if we are looking at where the crimes occur, then potentially they are occurring in, in places where there are marginalized communities, absolutely. Because that's where people who are suffering those other uh, societal issues of you know, food insecurity, job insecurity, home insecurity, all those types of things. Uh, additionally, I think predictive policing can actually uh, give you the opposite view. Uh, for example, opportunistic crimes. Very recently in Peel, we um, had a high-end car theft ring and there was uh, about 60 cars uh, of very high value stolen. So if you take the predictive view on that, you'll look and say, hey, this neighborhood, which is particularly affluent, is experiencing a lot of crime. But really in the grand scheme of things, it's a blip. Uh, we had uh, turned out, we have captured the offenders. They came in from uh, out of province. They were committing all these crimes and then we put an end to it. Again, in the grand scheme of things, once they're done with their job, they may move on to another province and continue their, their act. There won't be a predictive element to that. They may come back in three years. They may never come back. We don't know. So sometimes it's, it's about looking at the, crime, um, the crimes in the context. So while there might be a predictive element to it, we can't focus strictly on the predictive element. Just because it happened once doesn't guarantee that it'll happen again. Of course, statistically, uh, you can look at different types of things. For example, um, you would say after uh, after 2 a.m. when it's the last call, there's gonna be some disorderly conduct around the bar. Don't really know that you need predictive analysis to know that. Uh, police officers doing community-based policing and knowing their communities will know where the problems are and when they come and, and use it with the cause. So I think there's a role for it, but I don't think we should view it as a panacea. It's not, again, another shiny tool that we should buy and it's gonna tell us exactly what to do and we're gonna become so much more efficient. If you had the ultimate power what would crime analysis look like at Peel? And what changes would you implement? Great question. And, and one that I had considered then, I don't know that there's a perfect answer to this, but certainly there's certain elements that I would like to weave. So in creating our analytics bureau, we did uh, build the position profiles and the roles such that there's a, an IT slant all of them. So we want our BI specialists to be able to do dashboard development. And we did hire, our data engineer was actually a former IT person who had knowledge of where all the CAD data was, the niche data was, and how to transform that. So I think that there's a strong IT element required to support analytics and analysis. 
because I, I personally believe that IT needs to be very close to their customer. You run the risk that if everything is centralized, that people won't call, or when they call and they need something, they get bounced around a bit or they get into a big queue, and it slows down the organization overall. So I think it's really important that by having IT people close to the business, they understand the business priorities and uh, the business context, which helps to uh, service the customers well, but also to give the customers really good solutions. Uh, it's not good enough to be fast or it's not uh, good enough to deliver a great solution and take three years to do it. There's a balance to both. So sometimes you can take a long time and deliver something good, but sometimes you just have to do something really, really quick that brings you a lot of value in the short term, like a quick win. Um, so I think that's what I would do. Um, I would love to, to have a bit more um, ability to rotate people around a little bit more uh, so that they do get different flavors uh, of different lines of business because notwithstanding the fact that, again, I talked very much about how divisional policing is different from bureau policing, which is, again, I didn't even talk to you, but like intelligence policing, right? So uh, whereas in, in our intelligence unit, a lot of that stuff is proactive stuff. So there hasn't been a, a specific occurrence that's being investigated but it's looking for people who are in terrorism, people who are in organized crime and then tying that all together. So where divisional is very reactive and bureau is a little bit reactive, but with a lot longer scope, intelligence is almost pre, uh, uh, proactive in that respect in um, um, t uh, tending to uh, sources and, and digging out all this data to build a, a massive case around it. So I think some uh, a little bit more natural uh, transition among all the different roles would be good. Tony, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and government restrictions are, are now significantly impacting the Peel region. What's the future of this new work from home environment as it relates to your analysts? Is it here to stay? And what do you think the implications are? That's a fantastic question. And we've actually been uh, struggling with that for several months. So coming out of March 18th, we did have all our non-essential staff committed to home, which included the analysts. Because it happened so fast, it did take us a little bit of time to get equipment for our analysts to be able to work from home. But after a couple of weeks, we were able to do that. Uh, what we had found is analysts could do the bulk of their functions remotely. We did provide them with a laptop and uh, they were able to connect to their own machine, which had all their specialized software, which typically uh, is a problem for IT is getting the software moved around. So that worked reasonably well. So the challenge to that is on the surface, I think it demonstrated that yes, they are very capable of working from home, and, and I would agree. I think what you lose is the connection to the investigative side. So the camaraderie that happens by having your analyst right beside you, the informal conversations, the, sometimes you'll you know, turn your head and ask the analyst something, but if they weren't in the office, you may not email them, you may not even call them if they're not there. Uh, and also there, it, it doesn't help that disconnect between the investigative team and the civilian team. So we very much view crime analysts as investigators. But if you look at it from the context of all uniform officers had to come to work every day throughout the pandemic, but civilian members were deemed non-essential and were sent home. Well, that sends a message to the investigative team. They're, they're really not like one of us. So I think it doesn't help the relationship. And I think notwithstanding all the tangible deliverables were met, I think there's a lot of intangible stuff that can't be done by having the analysts working remotely. Uh, it's something that we've struggled with, and we've even talked about, well, should we do a modified schedule where it's three days a week in, in the office and two days a week from home? Again, I'm not sure that that um, allows for appropriate connection, especially at the divisional level, where you have officers working 12-hour shifts. So you may not see an officer for two weeks, depending on how the shifts fall. So it's really hard to build a connection with investigators if you only see them every other week. And if you happens to be the week that you're working from home or the days that you're working from home, it may be four weeks before you make a connection. And again, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, IT, much like analytics, they're people-based businesses, they're, they're people roles, and the people are important. And the people have to be not only connected to the organization and to their boss, but to their peers and to their colleagues. And it's hard to build that connection uh, remotely. Uh, I'll also add to that, that because we were thrown into this world like many other organizations, uh, we were ill-equipped from a video conferencing perspective. So even to this day, not everybody has video conferencing capability at Field Police. Because we didn't have a remote workforce, it wasn't the need, now it is. So perhaps once we build out that capability, those types of relationships can grow the same way we're doing this uh, uh, interview right now where we can see each other and we can see each other's facial expressions and hear tone of voice. Those things are really important for building relationships. So perhaps one day when the technology at Peel anyway, catches up with us, it might be a very workable model. You make some great points, Tony. Congratulations on your recent promotion. 
I understand you're currently playing dual roles with managing analytics and being IT director. Someone else will soon be taking on your current role in the analytics bureau. What's going to be in that letter on your desk addressed to the incoming analytics manager? That's a really great question. And um, what I would say is, is kind of what I would say almost for any role is focus on the people. The people are the ones that you uh, you will um, succeed or fail based on their success. If you can make them successful, you will be successful. You need to support them and you need to make sure that you're there when they need you. Uh, what I had found is that uh, the analysts, again, um, when I took over, I'm just generally very responsive with my email and text messages and, what, and I was always getting back to them. And I found it really helped to build the relationships because they knew they weren't on their own. They knew they weren't alone. Um, even from time to time, like I'll give one silly example, uh, but one of my divisional analysts, their plotter broke and the parts were on back order and she needed some things printed. I said, that's fine, print them at my plotter and I'll drive them over to you. So just having that connection to the people uh, in order for them to achieve their business objectives, you know, for me, it's not really that big a deal, but I think a lot of people would say, what, the manager's gonna drive over some printouts? It's for the good of the business. Officers need these things, they're part of investigations. We need to keep our eye on the fact that yes, we're a support service, but at the end of the day, it's all about policing and we need to focus on that. So being there for our people, I think is absolutely key. The second part that I would talk about is, uh, or that I would leave in that letter was about the technology. Really take a good hard look at the tool sets before we run out and buy more things. Perhaps before you even buy anything is rationalize what you have uh, and be selective about what you buy. Be realistic about the capabilities because vendors will, will sell you the moon and then you'll come in and you'll get the stars perhaps. And if your people don't embrace it, then you're not gonna get anything. So you have to make sure that it's the people, process and technology have to all work together in order to get a good business objective. I think that's great advice for any leader. And finally, what advice would you have for anyone looking to get into this crime analysis game? Oh, that's a really good question. And actually I'll say uh, the future of crime analysis is very bright. Um, we've had the opportunity over my 18 months that we've had a number of co-op students they were really, really sharp. So I say our educational institutions are doing a fantastic job of turning out uh, job ready analysts. Um, one of the things that we had found is depending on your specific area of focus in your uh, undergrad while doing your undergrad is uh, most of the analysts came out with uh, maybe a shallower than we would like uh, ability in, in spatial mapping and GIS type technologies. So certainly we think that's an important piece but from an analysis perspective and from a, a thought process perspective, universities are doing a fine job of turning out great, great uh, candidates. Tony, I appreciate your insights. Peel Police is fortunate to have an IT director that understands the technology needs of crime and intelligence analysts. Thanks for some of your time and I hope you'll come back and join us again. Thank you, Manny. It was really my pleasure and I, uh, I kind of love to talk, especially about the topics that I'm passionate about and you know, uh, technology has always been one, and now I've developed a passion for, for analytics. So thank you very much for allowing me to share that. That's Tony Ventura, Peel Police IT Director, Analytics Manager, former colleague, and friend. If you found value in this video, smash that like, click subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell so you don't miss any of our episodes. See you next time.